Thank you so much for joining us today. I'm Claudia Holland, a Chief of the Bureau of Library Development in the Division of Library and Information Services located in Tallahassee, Florida. Uh, if you haven't been up here for a while, we'd love to have you. So keep us in mind when you're traveling up 75 and you wanna go west just a little bit. If you wanna go the busy bee, just keep on going. <laughs> um, we are focusing on a particular topic today, just like we do normally. Uh, today is today's topic is social services that are offered in libraries. Um, just so you know, in case you haven't joined us before, we do have a particular topic, but if you have something else that you would like to discuss or ask questions about or whatever is, is you know, uppermost in your mind, please feel free to, to talk about it. These sessions are for you. They're, they're not for me to talk to you. It's for people to talk among each other. Uh, there's been a great deal of interest from libraries in partnering with professional social workers to assist patrons with various critical needs such as housing, food assistance, employment, and, and the list goes on. Uh, some libraries in Florida have uh, established services in the past couple of years. Uh, some are exploring the possibility of adding these services or they've added them more recently and they want to share their experiences with you. Today, we're really fortunate to have several people join us to talk about implementing social work services in their library. They include Adam Davis from Palm Beach County Library System. Hey, Adam. Uh, Shauna Hines and Sheba Previous from Miami-Dade Public Library System. Ladies. Vanessa Neblett from Orange County Library System. Hey, Vanessa. And we're also fortunate to have Melissa Gross and Don Latham from Florida State University who want to take a few minutes in a little bit and talk about their current research on this topic. Uh, welcome to you all. We're just thrilled to have you. Uh, what I'd like to do is uh, sort of how I handled uh, the um, facilitation piece of, of this hour is start with some questions. Uh, if you have a question that you would like to ask, just jump right in. Uh, this is like uh, Amy said, this is very informal. Um, the question I'd kind of like to start with is at what point do did libraries, library staff realize that they had a need for social work assistance on site? What, you know, what was the impetus for, for your doing this? Was there a tipping point? Did a particular incident occur or did you just build that this into your strategic plan and decide that this was something you wanted to to give a shot if anyone would like to jump in go for it and if you have a webcam and want to share we'd love to see you i can share um this is me shana hensey with the miami Dade public library system hello everybody hello um, for our library system, we really started it as we started to realize that we meant more to our community than the traditional, such as, you know, the technology, the books, the outreach, the programs. Um, but then we decided, you know, what kind of services could we give the community that they seriously need? It was actually before the pandemic when we started our strategic plan in about 2017. And some of the things that we realized were, you know, when we went out to the community and we were surveying people, um, trying specifically to get non-users. And a lot of the questions, <coughs> excuse me, when we asked, you know, what do you, what could the library do for you? And the answer was, oh, I don't know. <laughs> and then the next question was, well, what would be helpful to you in your life right now? And a lot of the answers were, you know, internet, internet at home, computer use at home, childcare, help with rent. You know, we've got all these sort of social services answers. And that was social services was kind of built into our strategic plan at that time but it wasn't a huge cornerstone and i'll say probably around 2019 is when more and more of the conversation started get going started to get going 
um, Miami Dade Public Library System instituted a social social services and libraries committee. And that committee started talking about all the different resources that had to do with social services that we could possibly do or that the community needed. And then <laughs> right around that time, Melanie um, with Seflin approached us and the conversation began about social workers in the public library. Mm -hmm. Awesome. And here in Palm Beach County, um, and, and I think this is really true for almost every uh, public library and maybe every library in general, um, I think there's always been a need for, uh, for social services, regardless of whether we knew that that's what we were going to call it or not. You know, we work with people who are unemployed, who are homeless, who are about to be homeless, uh, who are dealing with mental health issues. Um, and that's something throughout my entire career that has been normal um, in uh, working in a public library. But it never, we never called it social services and libraries. Um, I think the impetus for us here um, to start talking about all these services in the context of, of social work um, was probably around, you know, the worst part of, hopefully it was the worst part in the past, past tense of the opioid epidemic and trying to figure out, you know, what are we going to do um, or what do we do when we find uh, needles um, in, in our libraries or when someone overdoses in our libraries. And um, I know a lot of us have experienced that. Um, and then kind of like Shauna, uh, you know, I was approached by Seflin, by Melanie, to um, see if there was something that we wanted to set up um, as a region uh, to continue to discuss social services. Um, luckily, we had had experience um, providing certain ser social services already um, when the Social Security Administration uh, closed its doors while it was renovating. Um, we welcomed them in uh, to our libraries uh, when uh, the uh, Palm Beach County um, Food Bank couldn't uh, handle all of the uh, SNAP benefits in uh, processing in their offices. They asked us if, uh, if we wanted to um, work with them, and it was a natural fit. So mm -hmm. um, that was the impetus for us as well. Great. Yeah. Thank you. Anyone else want to share? Sure. Um, uh, this is Vanessa from Orange County Library. Hi, um, hello. Um, so uh, the social worker at our in our organization um, came about because of our Right Service at the Right Time grant. So in 2017, as part of the grant, we um, proposed to do a pilot program to have a social worker come and uh, you know take appointments with the community, walk-ins, and things like that. And uh, so it was a natural um, expansion of the Right Service at the Right Time, which is a social services website for the state. Um, it, it, so it just was kind of a, a nice little flow and it proved very successful. And so after that, we kind of looked to incorporate um, the social worker position as part of our, our regular employment, um, which we have pretty much since then. Um, with little lulls from when we've lost people and things. Um, I can say that we just finally got a, a replacement uh, three days ago, uh, last week, so yay. Um, and it was very uh, noticeable for staff and for our community um, when we had about two months or so without a social worker. Um, and and so that's you know where, how kind of about Orange County came about from that. So people are actually coming to the library to to take advantage of the social uh, work services that are in your libraries. Absolutely, um, we have uh, we use Communico as a scheduler, and so people can book one hour appointments. Currently, um, mm -hmm. previous to the pandemic, it was pretty much walk ins, and we also were at different locations. Um, since the pandemic. Um, We've limited it to main, our main library since we actually have space um, that we can still we can socially distance and and be alert on those kinds of things, and um, as opposed to just taking you know whoever comes in or whatever, uh, people can book a, a reservation up to seven days in advance, hour long. Uh, they can say what they want to talk about 
under different topics, unemployment, government assistance, food stamps, et cetera. Um, and, or not, it's up to them. Um, we have a number of people that say, that say, I don't, I don't want to say, I will talk to the social worker when I get there, yeah. which is perfectly yeah. fine. Um, and, and yes, yeah, so, um, uh, I believe since November of last year, we began, um, the in-person appointments for, um, the, our community to make, to visit with the social worker. Mm -hmm. So do you do uh, do it remotely as well? Have have any has anyone done done remote services or just strictly in house? Um, well, they do. Uh, uh, the social worker can respond through email and or calls, um, but that's pretty much the virtual. I don't believe we've had any with maybe during the pandemic part. Um, mm -hmm. I I came into this position in February, um, and we were meeting in person at that point. Um, but email and phone calls are a, a definite way that um, contact can be made. But as mm -hmm. we know, a lot of, you know, a number of the people that need those services do not have a phone and or an email address. Mm -hmm. um, so that's why we really um, wanted to have the in-person to come back because, because of the need. Um, and, but, but those avenues are still available as an option. Nice. Do you all, uh, Palm Beach and Miami day, do you all have the same set up? Here in Miami, we primarily stick to walk-ins where um, we've been also debating um, putting up some sort of sign-up system, whether it's online, whether it's Communico. We're kind of taking the wait and see approach because for right now, it seems that our clientele really does well with coming in when they can and not, not making appointments um, that they might tend to miss. So that's been working with us perfectly right now. Mm -hmm. um, we have done a few uh, virtual sessions through DoxyMe, however, and that has done, been done primarily through the LCSW um, that works with Cephalin mm -hmm. with great success. And um, so Palm Beach County Library System had a social worker here between um, January and June of this year, and we're currently working on the next iteration of, of that program. Um, we did strictly uh, first come, first serve walk-ins. Um, and, you know, for the most part, it worked, it worked fairly well. Um, the second week that we had a social worker here, we had people who had heard by word of mouth that we had someone here and just started, you know, coming wow. in and every, you know, my biggest concern when we started this was, are we going to have enough people who come in and use this service? Because I need to prove that this is something yeah. that's worthwhile for the library. That from the second week, it was never a question. Um, we had people coming in all the time. Um, and something that I, you know, when people question whether uh, it's, uh, whether there are enough there's enough infrastructure in the world to provide the services that people need i remind people that no one has in the history of of the world has ever said that there are enough social workers um to be had for everyone um i think everyone can benefit from this and people definitely know that mm -hmm. great wonderful uh how do you all handle privacy privacy concerns I'll just keep going, I guess, um, okay. for, for, for just a couple seconds. Um, uh, for the most part, we had uh, an area in the public in the public where the social worker would work with them, um, specifically if uh, she was helping uh, the member fill out a form or something like that. But in the cases where someone wanted had some really tough issues that they needed to talk out with the social worker, we did have a room available for uh, for her to use at any point. So if anybody's thinking about setting it up, it is absolutely important to have some space that, that can be made private if needed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right, here at Miami-Dade, we had several options. Um, we've got a larger space for groups. Um, some of that takes place. We've partnered with an organization called Florida Services Incorporated, and they come once a week to do group therapy. Um, and then, 
the options that we have for our social workers are that we have some office space reserved just for the social workers and the clients. And then we also have a space that's more off to the side, but out in the open um, where, you know, if the topic uh, fits the situation and it can be done right out there, then they can do that. And that's a good place for connecting folks with, um, you know, different resources that are publicly available in the community. But as um, Adam had mentioned, if they needed counseling or it was a topic that was a little more sensitive or the person was feeling very sensitive and, you know, was maybe crying or something of that nature, then they would have the more private room to go to, but would also be, um, you know, open and, you know, other staff could see the area mm -hmm. for safety mm -hmm. reasons. So does a social worker tend to work, uh, and Sheba, this is maybe a question for you. Um, do you tend to work uh, alone or is there a librarian with you or uh, to help with any in any way? Or, you know, how do you like to, to handle these services? Hi, everyone. Um, Hi. I do have two interns that work along the side with me. So when I do have a patron who want to address a sensitive issue, I'm able to pull that patron to the side and have those type of discussion and refer them to the outreach program that can assist them. Mm -hmm. So I do have two other interns that works with me from Southland. I see. Okay. Anybody want to add to that? Our, our social worker is um, <clears throat> one person, um, but it is on, uh, we do have a, a, they're in a study room. So going back to your privacy, um, it's a study room that's glass in case so you can see in and the door can close and things like that. Um, but uh, the floor is, it, it's our main reference area. Um, so if help is needed, um, they can always come out for help, but um, it is pretty much a singular one-on-one. -on -one at Orange County. Mm -hmm. We didn't really have any direct library librarian oversight over the social worker while she was here. Um, one of the things that was really important for me to recognize and for everyone to recognize was that this isn't our wheelhouse. Our wheelhouse is what we do on a day-to-day -day basis. And the reason we needed a social worker is because they know what they're doing better than than we do. So it's, it, you know, I wouldn't want to stifle um, someone's ability to help a patron um, uh, when they're the ones who, who know what they're doing. Um, that being said, there's constant communication. Um, so it's not as if this person is working alone. And we certainly, um, you know, want to make sure that they're in a safe environment so that if there is an emergency, we're, we're there with them 100% of the time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, I know that we have mentioned um, certain partnerships. So can you talk a little bit more about the partnerships that you all have developed uh, in response to you know, maybe kicking off this this new program, or as it has evolved, um, you know, if you have developed other relationships, partnerships with um, agencies or institutions that have been quite helpful to you. Here at Miami Dade, we actually started partnering with the Homeless Trust, and what that enabled us to do is sort of transform our branch here at the main library into not only offering and connecting people with resources, but actually acting as an access point, a designated access point with the Homeless Trust to be able to connect people with beds. So it was just like if these people went to a homeless shelter to register or sign up for a space in that shelter, we were able to do the exact same thing for folks. And that opened up a lot of avenues of support for folks because um, we realized there was, you know, a whole population of resistant people that, um, you know, have sort of, for want of a better word, been burned, you know, by these systems or places they've gone to and did not feel empowered to take the next step in their life. 
And when we started having that at our library, uh, we noticed that the patrons started, started seeing us as more advocates for them in the community. And they became to be, they started to be more comfortable and trustworthy of us. And we did qu get quite a few of them off the street and into <coughs> permanent supportive housing through the HMIS system. Um, another partnership that we had right during the pandemic when everything was closing was a partnership with the Lotus House. And that's a local women's and families um, shelter complete with um, their own health and wellness wing with a psychiatrist and counselors and just, you know, state of the art programs. And what we did is we brought in our social workers to the families there and offered story time, um, wellness, um, poetry, songs, music, dance. And um, that became one of, a favorite program of uh, many of the children at Lotus House. Oh, that's awesome. Um, well, uh, through this process, uh, because we were working through Cephalin, I met Shauna, um, only virtually at this point, um, oh. uh, because uh, Miami-Dade was a year ahead of us in, in terms of this, this particular project. I was able to learn a lot from Shauna and from uh, Miami-Dade. Um, also through this, talking, so um, like Miami-Dade, we're part of a larger county government. Um, and I just, I loved talking about this to other county departments because when I'd mention it, people's eyes would light up and like, yeah, that, that makes total sense. And so we, I think we gained a lot of um, li new library fans who saw us not just as um, book peddlers, which we, we haven't been for a long time. We've been doing, you know. <laughs> everything under the sun. The century, yeah. <laughs> um, but uh, one of the uh, one of the particular uh, um, relationships that we started with was the community services department who has been responsible for the emergency rental assistance um, uh, uh, getting people who've who've are um, behind on their utilities or their rent uh, rentals um, the money that they need in order to stay housed. Um, and we, the library system has been, uh, our staff have been processing those applications for almost six months now. And we did it for, you know, a, a period of time last year. And we were also able to work with them to secure funding through another organization to have um, another dozen people hired that could have uh, help people as they come into the library. So this has really opened up doors, a ton of doors for us with other county departments recognizing that there's no other place in Palm Beach County that has 17 locations that are free and open to people um, from all walks of life. Um, so, yeah. Wow, yeah. Vanessa, anything you wanna add to that? Um, well, uh, we haven't, to my knowledge, really ha uh, have had partnerships or things like that. We've really focused on, you know, bringing people in, but that is one of the areas that is on my to-do list, um, especially, yeah, to make those connections and bring, you know, other people in because there are people that maybe don't want to talk about something yet. They're not ready to do that, but want to find out information or how to go about it or, or just, you know, finding, getting that to do on their own. Um, so it is something that um, we'll be looking into especially this coming year. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So some people are do, providing the service only at one branch or one main library. Are, 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 I mean, I, I heard what you said, Adam, about 17 locations that are open to the public, which is a, a very uh, tantalizing uh, uh, feature for libraries and, and reaching communities on, you know, in their areas. Um, how would that impact you all uh, if you were to offer this service at every single branch? How would you manage that? How would you budget for it? How would, you know, I mean, 
Well, as far as, uh, and again, our social worker program was from January to June. Um, the next iteration of it, it was just at the main library. So the next iteration is going to have to, we're going to have to figure out how to branch out to other branches. Mm -hmm. um, as far as social services, because we're also relying on our partners to be able to provide those services, we are actually able to serve people at all locations or almost all locations. So um, relying on, on community resources like the food bank, like the community services department um, and, and the health department, um, that enables us to be able to go to all branches. Will we ever have a social worker in every branch? Probably not. Um, uh, but that's why, um, for us, uh, partnering with, with other organizations was key to making this successful. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I guess I should say here at Maine, um, as of right now, the social services unit is based here, but that is scheduled to change at some point, perhaps when our health and wellness center opens. Um, in the west part of the county, uh, they could be based there. And then the, the idea is they would go out to the different branches that needed it the most, um, depending on some sort of schedule. Um, mm -hmm. Right now, however, they are they're actively taking calls from other branches who have issues or have patrons that have needs that the social services um, social social workers can assist. The other thing they're working on as we speak is a resource that they can give to all 48 other branches so that the library staff that's at the front on the front lines can easily look at this resource and see if they can connect the patrons that are needing these resources together. Mm -hmm. And I found out too, um, a nice resource, if anyone's interested, um, <coughs> is findhelp.org. Um, I've seen it replicated many different ways um, as resources and things of that nature, but basically it's a website where you can put in whatever zip code you're in and you can find <coughs> health resources, cash resources, transportation resources, um, resources for education, citizenship, you name it. And so it, that has also been a nice resource for staff to go to in a pinch. Hmm. So, um, oops, well, sorry. No, you go ahead, please. Um, uh, yes, currently um, we have one social worker at the main library. Previous to the pandemic, um, the social worker would visit uh, different locations. I think it was a total of five throughout the week. So one day at um, uh, at a location, and um, I believe one day was a, a, a half day at two different locations, but in a, a close vicinity. So you you know commute wasn't that bad. Um, ideally, um, we've applied for ARPA funding to hire two additional social workers so that we can cover the county um, better with the one-on-one -on -one service. Um, so hopefully those will be coming in soon and that'll help um, our community in, in the various areas to, to have a presence there. Um, as I mentioned, this is part of the right service at the right time. Um, that's how it originally started. And so that's available throughout the state, including at all of our locations, especially since we are, we kind of run it. Um, and so uh, those so we're always looking at that too to make sure that we have those resources readily available um but yes it would be great to have uh a, a person that's the one thing that i think we've found is being able to speak to somebody in depth really one-on-one -on -one about various needs that people have so we're hopefully trying to move closer to that um, with the additional um, two social workers great now, let me remind those who are on the call to jump right in uh, with any questions you might have. Uh, Amy, do we have any questions from from folks? Um, not yet. Mm -mm. I see one from Wendy Bost. Uh, sure, I can ask if you want me to. That'd be awesome. Thank hi, you. Hi, Vanessa. Hi, Lynette. Hi, people I know. Oh, <laughs> hi to everybody. Um, I'm here in Brevard County, and I wanted to talk a little bit about two things. 
One is liability in terms of any mental health issue um, and or, or if someone has a mental health, do you just primarily refer them to agencies? Um, and then the second is, can you talk about how you measure success? Like what are the measures that you're using for their um, work? Please, and thanks. Thank you. Um, that was a really good question. Um, could you elaborate on what you meant by liability? Um, do you mean, do we have them sign, sign some sort of a waiver before they receive service or well, something more specific? Either that or the, the question I've been asked is, in other words, if you're helping someone through a mental health, if they're in crisis, um, there's a, and something happens to them and you've been meeting with them, is there a responsibility in terms of that liability, in terms of insurance or something along those lines, or you know, has that come up as an issue um, that's been asked of me? We also put in for funds, Vanessa, on the same thing, so funny. Um, but we did ours through Nephilim, so maybe we'll see some opportunities. For us, we, um, we had a great form that was developed through Zeppelin. Um, and on at the end of that form was a waiver. So we're working on tweaking it to our um, our need, our needs at our library system. But that was a great beginning place to be able to include, you know, questions on what people might need help with, preliminary questions, and then at the end a sort of disclaimer or waiver, if you will. Um, once <coughs> once we make recommendations on that. You know, that'll pass through to our director, county attorney, and be okayed by everybody before we use it. Oh, I'd love to see that. Yeah, when I can get it okay, can you share it? I would have to check on that That's fair <laughs> for you, but I will share how I'm, how I'm deciding, you know, how we're going through the process, which is certainly finding out what other library systems are using for theirs. We have other specific questions regarding um, liability and waiver as well, um, such as maybe holding on to documents or what's in their file or, you know, even signing their names on a list that's in the public. I mean, there's lots of little ins and the outs, and I'd mm -hmm. like to find out what other library systems are doing and you know, do they have a legal department that they're going through? How, how is this all being decided by other library systems? And then basically take that and make some recommendations to our library system and then go from there. Yeah. Sean. I can imagine that uh, libraries that are just starting to think about uh, providing this service, that's a very good question uh, because you're gonna be asked that probably by your your uh, governing authority, um, you know, how, how does this affect the library, the county, the, you know, whatever, uh, the municipality, the, whatever y y your uh, governing system is. Um, so, yeah. Uh, uh, Sheba, do you have any uh, thing you want to add about that, sort of the legal um, ramifications that you're aware of that, uh, that folks could could look into? Um, some of my concerns, um, like Shauna um, verbalized, is the privacy. You know, a lot of the um, conversations are very sensitive. Yes. So, like, we're still exploring how we could go about that. Um, so, right now, what we're doing is that we're taking the time to explore that. And, um, like Shauna said, eventually we'll come up with a waiver. You know, that would protect us within the field and also them as well. That's the goal. So, Shauna, you're doing this now. No, I'm sorry, Shiva, you're doing this now? You're the social worker? Yes. Well, thank you. I just um, want to say thank you. Because we, I, we had, I had a lot of questions in regard to that. You know, yeah. I'm, very, I'm very big, um, you know, privacy. And that's one of the, you know, the strong, you know, issues that we're, um, we have here and we're tackling that. Mm -hmm. um, so like you said, like Shana said, we're reviewing the waiver that's self and develop and see how we could, you know, 
Nick picks some of the um, his mm -hmm. up on it and make it one big thing for us because like a lot of the patrons that come in don't like to sign multiple disclaimer and waiver you know they make them uncomfortable mm -hmm. so we're trying to come up with one page mm -hmm. um you know that could protect them and protect uh, us as well mm -hmm. that was actually a, a huge question uh for us when we were working um uh with uh, county administration is like you know because not everyone uh, had, knows that there's a history, at least a 10 year history of um, social workers and libraries. The good thing about getting into this now is that there are so many libraries across the United States that have already done this and that have probably come up with these resources already. Um, there's a really great uh, listserv, Whole Persons Librarianship. Is that what it's called, Shauna? Whole Persons Librarianship or Whole, Whole Persons Library? Um, it, which is just libraries um, who uh, already have a social work program or are interested, and everyone is so eager to share resources. Um, so that's a, a great way to find out what other um, uh, what other libraries are using. As far as um, success, um, certainly, um, you know having people show up out of the blue on the second week and continuously come in and take up our social workers time for four months was a measure of success but also um and shauna can probably uh, talk a little bit more about this but um with the there were forms that Cephalin set up that um you, you could kind of take a look and see what services were provided at every session and what I did is I took those, um, uh, the kind of idea of each session and try to match it with a county uh, a strategic priority um, and link those things so I could make the case to anyone that this is perfectly in line with um, what the county um, is here for and how, how we serve the public. Great points. Uh, Sheba, I wanted to ask you too about vetting uh, students. Uh, you have interns. Are they students, or are these practicums that uh, that are being offered by a, a local college or university, or how does that work? I can I can answer that. Um, just so you know, our, our Sheba here just joined us very very recently, oh, okay. and um, she's still. <laughs> learning the tracks on how everyone has come to be here and the whole process involved with our partnership with Zeppelin and FIU and, you know, the school involved and everything else. Mm -hmm. um, so truthfully, um, we have gotten our volunteers, um, volunteers, well, interns, um, who are earning their master's degrees at local universities from Suplin. They interview with Suplin. They go through the whole process with Suplin. Okay. They vet them. They do that entire process. I myself have been involved. And in, since we get new ones each each season, from time to time, um, I get offered to sit on an, in on these interviews. I'm sure, I think Adam has as well. And then um, really the only thing once once we are in agreement to have them is that they register as a county volunteer on our end and then <coughs> they receive the orientation through the um, LCSW who is also um, paid by Cephalin. His uh, salary is paid a little bit by our library system as well but mostly by Cephalin and then he divides his time between other library systems that are in the Cephalin region and part of the program, um, but truly they, they, they come from and, and they get, um, you know, they, they really come from the Zeppelin program. Mm -hmm. And then we hear about, you know, folks that are available that season and, um, you know, what school and everything else. And then they receive their orientation from 
RLCSW, and then they receive the orientation from our end as well. I always give them a, hey, what, how, what brought you here in, in the library world? And, you know, they may not, you know, have set foot recently in a library. So I tell them all about our library resources and things, you know, resource library world resources that they can fit in their sessions if it would benefit the clients and that sort of thing. And that's kind of how we, we tackle that. I hope that answered that question. Great. And Allison asked, um, how do you place these workers in your org chart? That's an interesting question. So for, for us, they're not, if they're not county paid, they're not on our official um, table of organization, but we consider them in our social services and libraries department. And as I mentioned, they're officially volunteers on our end. So if as volunteers, we wouldn't count them as as employees. Um, of course, Sheba is our, our very first county paid library staff member. So she appears on that table of organization. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> Great. OK. Um, so I was just going back. And her other question was, how do you fund these workers? So uh, I'm assuming some are volunteer and uh, obviously the professionals are being paid. Uh, are they be, being paid by uh, grant funds? Or is there a line item in your budget for them, et cetera? Uh, yes, our, our LCSW who works full-time, but not full-time you know, with our library system, he is being paid a little bit by the Miami-Dade Public Library System um, and most of it from grant funding from Cephalin. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then our interns are free. And they rotate every term? Correct, okay. every season. So it's usually the spring and then the fall season. Mm -hmm. yep. And so uh, is there a hiatus then in the summer? It's usually, <laughs> she came She came afterwards, but it's usually the LCSW. We were lucky this summer. And while he, his name is Milton, while Milton was getting more library systems on, on board, um, we actually got him almost full-time hours, if I remember correctly. So we were very lucky throughout the summer, but um, with the staff supplied to us from Cephalin, it, it wouldn't have been throughout the summer. So we, we were lucky this past year. Great. So, uh, I, and, and uh, Allison also asked about the long term, you know, what is the sustainability of a program like this? And, it, you know, of course, if you're relying on soft money, uh, that can be uh, a challenge. Um, but uh, that is certainly something that uh, I know that the division and the State Library Council, we frequently get um, applications for LSTA money. Uh, for in support of a social work program uh, in, you know, whatever, whether it's an individual library or a system that's applying or, um, or a multi-type library cooperative like Cephalon. Um, so if anybody has anything they want to add about that, have any outside um, external parties been, you know, approached? about supporting this program, which seems to be, you know, sustainability would be a really important issue, I would think. Well, um, so our uh, four or five months uh, un under the Cephalin program was, was a pilot for us. Mm -hmm. um, and it gave, uh, it gave us a ton of data that we were able, that we will be able to make a case that this is something that we should have permanently. Um, whether that happens or not is not not up to me. But um, like I said, um, the community need is is beyond what we could even offer. Um, I, I think 
because of the data that we collected in such a small amount of time, we can make the case that it's perfectly in line with the, with the library's mission and the county's mission. Um, you know, there are other examples in our library of, of programs like our Consumer Health Information Service that started out as a grant funded program. And when the grant funds ran out, it became a permanent part. And I mean, a part of, of our service, and that was 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. um, so um, uh, I'm also not opposed to begging for money and resources um, because I do feel like this is very important. Um, and I don't think that the need from the community is gonna go away in my yeah. lifetime. So as far as longevity, uh, and need, I'm not worried about that at all. Yeah, thank you. Vanessa, did you want to add anything to that? Sure. Um, as I mentioned, we did our pilot program, I think it was 2017 with Right Service, um, and it did prove successful. So we um, have a position created for social worker. Um, Going forward, it's it's to see you know how we would do with multiple more than one since we're used to one, <laughs> um, but yes, we we evaluated it and saw that yes, it should be a position in our library system. Awesome. Great. Um, I'd uh, I'd like to take just a moment and or a few minutes and uh, open the floor for Don and Melissa to talk about their research that they're doing uh, at, through FSU. Are y'all on? There you are. We can't hear you, but we see you. Can you hear me now? Can you hear me? Can you hear you, Melissa, yes. Oh, thank you, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Yes, thank you so much for allowing us to join you today. Um, you know, we've been interested in this topic several years ago. Don and I uh, were lucky enough to hear Sarah Zetterval uh, speak about whole person librarianship. And I think that that was really, um, you know, what sparked our, our interest. Um, and you know, we're interested in, in you know, several di different dimensions of this. One is just sort of exploring um, what's going on, you know, what is the experience, um, the attitudes, the perceptions of people in the library world, but also on the social work side of, of this trend um, that, you know, is growing. And, and from what I can tell, people have, have extremely positive um, attitudes about um, so we've been, uh, we did a, a survey of library administrators and we're currently involved. I, I think um, some of you have probably seen our ads in the newsletter <laughs> um, that we're looking for people, uh, you know, to talk to. And we've had a really good response from branch managers and from librarians. Um, we've had a much harder time um, finding social workers who work in libraries who are willing to do interviews with us. So that's um, you know, an area that we would like to bulk up, that we would, we would like to get more, um, you know, feedback on. Um, yeah, so we kind of want to understand the experience and, and what's going on with, with the trend. Um, I'm also interested in the boundary of the two professions. Uh, social work and the librarianship are very similar, but they're also different. They have very similar histories. Um, and I think it's, it's kind of an interesting idea to think about where does one start and where does, you know, the other stop and, and really what are the professional boundaries there in terms of the services that we provide and, and what should they be. Um, as an educator, both John and I are professors at the School of Information and as an educator, I, I also want to know, um, you know, how should we be preparing uh, librarians? enter the profession, you know, in regards to, um, you know, do we need to, um, you know, increase the skill base, make it more like uh, what social workers are taught in terms of, you know, how you interview people and how you, how you deal with, you know, the whole person in the, in the library. 
um, do we need to develop different models of collaboration with, with social workers and, and what would those look like? Um, you know, how do we manage and administer uh, uh, positions that really are, are outside of our professional domain? How do we assess them? So I think there are a lot, really a lot of questions that, that go on, um, you know, that come out of this this trend. And um, Claudia, you asked so many good questions today. I was really in, in awe of your of the questions you put out there because I thought they were all just really um, interesting and really got at you know a lot of the issues that um, I don't think have really been you know worked all the way through uh, in the in the library context. So helping to identify those issues and helping to answer some of those questions, you know, is also, I think, something um, that we're very, very interested in, in doing. So I appreciate you, you know, you letting me, <laughs> us, uh, you know, just kind of be the fly on the wall, you know, as, as you discuss this today. It's, it's very, it's very helpful. Well, we're glad that you joined us. And Don, did you have anything you wanted to add? Well, I was just going to also say I thought I thought your questions were excellent, and uh, really they're they're some of the same questions that we're grappling with in our research. Um, and I think Melissa summed up our our interest in this area and sort of what we're doing very nicely. I just wanted to kind of emphasize what she said. We are currently uh, working on a project where we are interviewing uh, managers, librarians, and social workers, and. We've gotten really good response from managers, um, good response from librarians, but most of them have been librarians that are in libraries that don't have a social worker. And we're, we're interested in talking with those folks, but we would like to talk with more librarians who are in libraries that have social workers. But in particular, we are really, really interested in talking with social workers. So if you happen to be in a library where you interact with a social worker, um, again, our uh, call for participation is in September and October e-newsletters and in, uh, in November uh, newsletter as well. Um, and Claudia has our call for participation, uh, and I'm sure she'd be happy to share that uh, if you wanted to, to check in with her. Well, and I would too. I can certainly share my email address in the chat box. So that people... be great. If you don't mind doing that, that would be wonderful. Uh, Sheba, I think you're on the hook there, hon. <laughs> <laughs> uh, she may yes, have, yeah, she may have some interesting uh, thoughts to share with you about that. Even though she's new at, at this, uh, at you know being involved with libraries, um, yeah. The, the the question about boundaries that that's a good one because um, I think there are some librarians and library staff who are very interested in reaching out uh, in any way they can to their communities uh, and helping them. And there are other people who are very gun shy about that. Um, I had, a, I, I was reading an article not too long ago about a young woman who decided that she didn't want to work in public libraries anymore. In fact, I don't even know if she was going to continue librarianship because she had to administer an Narcan shot, you know. And, and, it was like, whoa, you know, I'm, I'm, this is not what I signed up for. Um, I don't know how I would feel if I had had to do that. Um, you know, you do what you have to do when there's an emergency, that's for sure. But what, what is it that I think that the relationship uh, between the libraries and social work is a very um, dynamic and uh, heavily integrated uh, professional uh, partnership. And that's just my opinion. Um, having been in public and academic libraries, uh, public libraries have so much more that they have to deal with uh, in terms of the community and what, and what the community members need uh, and and uh, and want. So, anybody have any other questions that they would like to ask? Um, 
the wonderful folks who have come to share their wisdom with us. What would be, if you were doing it over, what would be the thing that you would do differently? Is there anything that you would have done differently that uh, might have streamlined the process, made it easier, um, you, you hadn't thought about putting together, uh, you know, from the standpoint of, of potential ramifications or needs, anything like that? Not that I, I wished I did it over. But the thing that strikes me as the cornerstone of the entire endeavor is a strong training program for staff. Because now once you involve social services worker, you've got two different types of services happening. You've got more of a concierge come whenever you can, you know, I'll, you know, I'm helping that you're helping them with these life and death situations of finding a roof over their head to food to eat. And, um, and then you have juxtaposed with that traditional library staff where we're used to most of the time, uh, questions about where the printer is and where a book may be. Um, so what I've noticed are our social workers are extremely adept at, um, trauma informed care and taking a very humanistic approach to customer service. And little by little, even without the training, um, staff have, st have started to pick up some of these tips and then techniques and include them in their everyday service. So without a doubt, one of the most important things was um, abundant <laughs> and um, appropriate uh, training for staff. Thank you. I think one of our biggest hurdles here, and, and I, I agree, I wouldn't do anything differently, um, but one of the biggest hurdles that we're still going to have to face is, is all of the um, bureaucratic things that go along with this, um, like uh, having agreements with schools uh, to host interns, um, uh, you know, coming up with all those forms for, for patrons and um, those are, I think, the most difficult parts of this because everything else seems to fit naturally. Um, I, I honestly, even just doing this for four months, I think that it's helped. It, it's I can only speak for myself. Um, I uh, a lot of us, in, especially in Florida, are asked to now serve in hurricane shelters, for instance, and being more. Um, aware of trauma informed care has really helped me reconceptualize what my role is in in a shelter so like i've we haven't really talked about this but i've learned a lot from uh the social worker that that we worked with and and i'm grateful for that um but the bureaucratic stuff is the most obviously the most boring part of it and also the most <laughs> difficult so but it's necessary awesome well any, anything else that anyone wants to share? I want to thank all of you for, for joining us today, for the speakers who came to share with us your experiences. Thank you so much. Uh, it, it's just great to have you. Um, uh, I think Amy mentioned this earlier, but the recording of, of this YouTube channel. Um, so if you'd like to go back and take a look at yourself while you were talking, you can do that. <laughs> uh, or if you have a tidbit you might have missed. Um, we'll be sending those uh, who registered this link, uh, the link to the recording, as well as a brief survey on the uh, DLIS discussions. And we hope you'll take a few minutes to, to complete. Uh, if you have a topic that you would like discussed at a future date and for a, a future DLIS discussion, please let me know. We're always looking for, for topics from everybody. Uh, we hope to see you again on November the 15th, so that's before Thanksgiving, at 3 o'clock Eastern for our next gathering. I don't know what the topic will be yet, but we'll be announcing that on our website and our newsletters and through our listservs, etc. Until then, thank you.